turn your Bible to the 8th chapter of Acts. This is where we'll have to read it. Starting in verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. And when Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. Our Father in heaven, we come thanking you for your word. We thank you, Father, for you recording events and things that happened in the past for us to study, for us to learn for us to be able to know who you are and what pleases you what you have prepared for us to know father we're thankful that we have people that are asking questions father as to what pleases you that we study and try to understand the scripture we're thankful father for people like john who expounds the scripture to us to explain what we need to know. We pray that our minds will be open and that we will study, that we will absorb your word, that we may understand who you are and what you would have us to do, the kind of people that you would have us to be, that we would be able to do what pleases you, Father. We recognize that our life on this earth is brief. As we contemplate eternity, Father, we recognize from your word that we have a choice. We can be with you or we can be in the lake of fire with people who do not desire to know you or to be with you. Father, we ask that you will guide us in our lives, that you will protect us from evil, that you will give us the strength that we need to persevere through this life. We pray for all those who are mentioned today, Father, that you will bless them in a way that is best for them, Father. You know what is best in all situations. And we ask that you do what is best. We pray, Father, for our country pray for our nation that righteousness will reign, that your children, Father, will be protected, <coughs> that we will be able to worship you freely. We 
pray, Father, for our brethren in other parts of the world who are suffering difficult circumstances, whether from floods or earthquakes or infirmities, from persecution, Father. We recognize this world as Satan and his desire is to destroy us all, Father. And we pray that you will protect us as we seek for you. Open our minds to understand the things that you would have us to know to be pleasing to you. Accept our prayers, Father. Accept our songs of praise. Accept our worship of you. We pray, Father, when we stumble that you'll gently correct us and bring us back to you. We pray in Christ's name. Good to be with you all again this morning. I'm thankful that the Lord has given us another opportunity to be out and for the health that we're able to enjoy uh, that allows us to be out as well. We're certainly mindful and praying for all those who are suffering illness at this time as well as those that are dealing with disease and upcoming surgeries and that kind of thing. Uh, very thankful to have... Uh, Sharon with us today. This is her first time with us as a new sister in Christ, and we're so grateful for that and, and uh, rejoice with her in her newfound life in Jesus. We certainly want to be an encouragement to her as she's been to us in rendering obedience. Well, we've been talking about this idea of taking the water of life. The reason that I've entitled that that way and thought about it is because I've as I've said, I've talked to a lot of people that seem to agree on the fact that Jesus provides the water of life, but there seems to be some disagreement about how we go and take that from him, how we possess it. So uh, Jesus says that uh, he has water of life. It's a, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Uh, he says that he will give the water of life. And then in Revelation 22, he, he says... Come, and uh, whoever desires, let him take the water of life. So we've been talking the last few weeks about 
exactly how one goes about taking the water of life. How do you go and get that? And so two weeks ago, we talked about faith, that a person takes the water of life by having faith in Jesus. And the, we talked about a lot of characteristics of faith, but uh, I suppose the overall message was that true faith always leads to obedience. We looked at uh, some who saw Jesus and believed in him, knew who he was, but allowed that to just be the end of the road for them, as opposed to like the jailer in Acts chapter 16, who went that very hour of the night, sometime after midnight, and was obedient to the gospel. That's true faith. And then last week we talked about repentance, defining repentance, looking at what repentance is and how it shows itself in the Bible, and discovered that while there are a lot of components that might make it up, it is the totality of those that equal repentance. It's, it is sorrow, it is sorrow for sin, but it's sorrow for sin that turns us into reformed people in our lives and our characters. And so we looked at various passages that demonstrated how sorrow leads to a penitent attitude, which then leads to reformation of life. And that's really uh, what repentance is. But as we continue, we want to talk about confession and baptism as a way that we go and take that water of life. That's what we'll be studying today. And even if you studied this in the past, I hope you'll do like me and try to look at all of this with fresh eyes and just let the Word of God talk to us, not with our own preconceived ideas. That's what I've tried to do uh, in this study. If you have questions or comments or you don't agree, then please get with me. Uh, I'd be glad to talk to you more about it. The first thing I want to point out is that confession and baptism are very closely related, kind of the way that we discovered that uh, sorrow and repentance are very closely related. You can't repent without being sorry for sin, but you can be sorry for sin without repenting. And so you have a like uh, uh, relationship between confession and baptism. And the confession that we're talking about uh, is our confession of faith in Jesus for who he is, that he is Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, as we go along. But I want to talk about the origin of where does this confession come from. And so when we think about the initial part of, uh, of this confession, you're, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. It came about because there were differences of opinion about who Jesus was. Some people believed that he was the real deal, that he was Messiah, that the scriptures had prophesied for hundreds of years that Jesus was the fulfillment of all those scriptures. And others believed that he was an imposter, and still others believed that he was the real deal, but they were afraid to say anything about it. And others believed perhaps that he was the real deal, but they weren't willing to make a confession of that and allow other people to know that they believed. So there was a vast array of opinions uh, about the Christ. And the confession comes as a way to identify where you stand on the Christ. We look over at John chapter 9 and beginning in verse 19, John 9 and verse 19. And here you have the, a blind man that has been healed by Jesus and now his parents are being questioned by the Pharisees. And it says that they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? So really they ask him two questions, right? Can you positively identify this as your son? And uh, can you, you know, identify him as, as a blind son? And how is it that he can see now? Verse 20, his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son. And we know that he was born blind. So they can positively identify him as their blind son. Verse 21, but by what means he now sees we do not know, or who opened his eyes we do not know. He is of age, ask him, 
He will speak for himself. So it sounds like they're pleading ignorance, does it? Well, if we keep reading, we find out it's really not ignorance. It's really timidity. It's really a lack of courage. It's, look at verse 22. His parents said these things because... They feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Aha! It's not that they didn't know, it's that they knew and they wouldn't say. Which meant they wouldn't what? They wouldn't confess. Because the Pharisees had said, if anybody confesses Christ, if they confess that Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of prophecy, the, the anointed one, the Messiah, if anyone confesses that, they're not welcome at the synagogue. And so that's why they failed to confess. Now Jesus has a very definite opinion about this, folks. If someone asks you, are you a follower of Christ? What are you going to say? If someone asks you that with the threat of jail time, what are you going to say? If someone asks you that with the threat of your life, what are you going to say? And you know, we begin to rationalize all kinds of things, don't we? Well, this guy's just a crazy man. What, why do I care what he thinks? I'll just tell him I don't believe in Jesus. I'll go in my way knowing I do believe in Jesus. I don't know if that'll work or not, folks. Look at what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Matthew 10, verse 32. Jesus says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, how do you think that falls in with our strategy to just confess to who we think we need to confess to? Jesus is asking for confessing people. He's asking for I people to identify themselves to be followers of his. And that's a part of being a disciple of Jesus is confessing our faith in him as Messiah, as the promised one, as the son of God who takes away the sin of the world. Over in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13, Jesus comes to his disciples it says, when, he, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, or others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He confessed faith in Jesus as the real deal. He is the Son of God. He is the one who was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. The one who is Messiah, the anointed one. And Jesus blessed him because of his confession. The confession comes about because it is a necessity, an absolute necessity. Jesus only takes confessing believers to be his disciples. And as we'll see as we roll along here, it's almost, it's virtually impossible for disciples of Jesus who are trying to make other disciples to do that without the aid of the confession. Let's continue on. When you think about Jesus, you know, think about our solar system and all the planets rotating around the sun. The sun is central to them. How do we feel about Jesus? You know, if you're going to be a part of the Muslim faith, you've got to confess that Muhammad is the prophet and that everything revolves around his teachings. You have to confess that or you cannot be a Muslim. Does it surprise us that Jesus would ask any less? That everything revolves around confessing Jesus as the Christ? Matthew chapter 1, when uh, the angel came to Joseph 
He said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she'll bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Jesus is the Greek form uh, of the Hebrew word uh, Yahshua. Jehovah is salvation. Salvation, saving. You'll call him Jesus because he's in the business of saving. He'll save his people from their sins. And everything revolves around Jesus. And he demands that we confess that of all of his disciples. So let's go to Acts chapter 8. I asked Bo before he started reading. I said, now, have you got verse 37? <laughs> Because some Bibles don't. Some Bibles uh, have a footnote. So, you know, they're all different ways. And we're going to talk about why that is this morning. I think it'll be good for us to look at that. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. What you saw in verse 37 is what we refer to as a textual variant. Of course, uh, many who would uh, cast dispersion upon the... Uh, the validity of the scriptures would say that a textual variant is proof that the Bible uh, is not correct, that it's not consistent. That is not the case at all, but you'll notice uh, in Acts 8 and verse 37, uh, your Bible should read, uh, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the answer to uh, the question in verse 36, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? And it leads to, verse 38, Philip baptizing the eunuch. Which, by the way, I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning with the most horrible feeling that all of a sudden I realized I had not answered in my own mind. If somebody asked you, who's the first Gentile that was converted? What automatically comes out of your mouth? Cornelius, right? Acts chapter 10, I woke up, I sat up straight in bed at 3 o'clock this morning. I said, what about the eunuch? I never answered that. I'm still answering it, so I'm not coming with anything concrete right now, but I just want you all to think about that. Here's a man that is not positively identified as a Jew. He seems to be at the very least a proselyte, but he's, going to, he's been to Jerusalem, he worships, he's reading the scriptures, he obviously believes them. But, you know, I did a little searching this morning, and people, especially people that are involved in black pride and that kind of thing, they have all kinds of articles about, it was a black man from Africa that was the first Gentile. Don't th say it was Cornelius. I was just amazed. I said, why did I never stop and think about this? Regardless of if he's the first Gentile or not, we know Cornelius is the first special case of a Gentile because the Holy Spirit fell, right? He fell exactly the same way that he did in Acts 2, exactly the same way, because Peter says he did. That doesn't happen here. So it's a different case regardless, but I'd just like for you to think about that. I just opened up a huge can of worms, didn't I? And I got no way to put them back in there yet. But anyway, a textual variant is... When there are different texts that say different things. Now, let me just tell you this. Try, try to hear everything I say about this. So far as I know, there are no manuscripts before the 6th century A.D. that contain verse 37 as a part of the text. Okay? So only after the 600s in manuscripts... Do we find verse 37 included in the text? But let me quickly say that that's not the only evidence for verse 37. Let me read you some comments from uh, Ellicott's commentary for English readers. This is what he says. The verse is a striking illustration of the tendency which showed itself at a very early period to improve the text of Scripture with a view to greater edification. It existed in the time of Irenaeus. Now, Irenaeus lived from, I'll bring it up here in a minute, but I think it's 120 to 202. I think that's right. You, you correct me when we get to the third slide. 
But anyway, verse 37 was quoted by Irenaeus in the first century. All right? So it may not have showed up in manuscripts until the sixth century, but Irenaeus quoted it in the first century. It is wanting in all the best manuscripts, including the Sinaitic and many other versions. The motive for the interpolation, and the word interpolation means to add something to. So, I mean, they're granting that the, you have the original manuscript, and, but you have this all through original manuscripts, scribe, scribal notes in the margin and things like that. They are granting that it had been added to a manuscript. The motive for the interpolation lies on the surface, the abruptness of the unanswered question, and the absence of the confession of faith which was required in the church's practice on the baptism of every convert seemed likely to be stumbling blocks, and the narrative was completed according to the received type of the prevailing order for baptism. Even with the insertion, the shortness of the confession points to a very early stage of liturgical development, as also does the refer reference to it in Irenaeus 130. I don't know what I said. It was 130 to 202 is when he lived. I think I said 120, so sue me. 130. All right? That's still the first century, folks. My whole point is it was prevalent then, and the very best scholars say the reason it was is because that's what the church did. If somebody wanted to be baptized, they had to tell you why. Doesn't that make sense? How would a, how would a preacher or a teacher or any disciple of Jesus know that someone was a candidate to be baptized unless they said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I won't baptize anybody unless they're willing to tell me that. Sharon, did you tell me that? Yeah, she sure did. And she was proud of it. And she should be. How else could you know? Confession is a necessary part. And so if any scribe or, or copyist ever did put that in, I'm not willing yet to say they did, but if they did, it wasn't for dishonest reasons. It's because that's what people did. What else could they do? And if we lost Romans 8, 37, would we, would we quit teaching people that you have to confess your faith in Jesus to be saved? No. How about Romans chapter 10, verse 8 beginning? What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Here, belief and confession are joined together hand in hand and made inseparable. And so confession obviously is a part of salvation. And how are you going to know to baptize someone unless they confess their belief in Jesus prior to that? And, and the answer is, there's just no way that you could. And how about 1 Timothy 6, and especially verse 12, where Paul says, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. So he says that Timothy confessed the good confession, and he says he was only imitating Jesus who confessed, <coughs> pardon me, the, <coughs> the good confession. Now, let me just go over to John 18. And verse 37, and let you remember Jesus standing before Pilate. Pilate said, are you a king then? Jesus said, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. 
everyone who was, is of the truth hears my voice. What did that angel tell Joseph? Mary's going to have a baby, even though she's a virgin. And you're, when she does, you're going to call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Pilate says, are you a king? Jesus confessed, I am not a king. I'm the king. And that's why I came into this world to bring truth to this world. So if we got rid of Acts 8.37... The New Testament still plainly tells us confession is a necessary part of going and taking the water of life. Now, why confess and be baptized? I want to bring up three points. Number one, for our own good. It's for our own good, number one, because it's commanded. Romans 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. When you put those together, and, and then you add Matthew 10, 32, and 33, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father in heaven. When you put those together, you see that it is commanded of every believer in Jesus and everyone who would be his disciple. So it's certainly for my own good because it's commanded, but it's also for my own good because it is a public commitment. It is taking the opportunity to say publicly, not in a corner, that I am taking Jesus as my Lord. I am putting my faith in him that, he, that God did raise him up the third day and that he'll raise me up to life when I'm finished with this life. It's a public commitment to that. And it is a public burning of that bridge to Satan. It's saying, I totally commit myself to Jesus and I completely block myself off from Satan. The confession is necessary for all of these reasons. And it serves such a grand purpose in the overall scheme of things. Uh, I, I've never just preached a lesson on confession before, I don't think. But I wish I had because it, it is so important. And, and when you look at the fact that Jesus commands it and that the apostles commanded in their writings as well. And the fact that Timothy gave his confession the same way that Jesus did before Pilate. How could we not put more emphasis on that? But why confess and be baptized? Not only for our own good, but for the good of others. That confession serves a purpose for others. I don't know who said this, but I wish it was me. Because it is such a grand truth. That is, seen religion is not always real, but real religion is always seen. Now, the Pharisees, to me, would be a great instance of seen religion that wasn't real. Uh, when you look at the Pharisee and the publican in the temple, man, he was seen, wasn't he? He probably said, <clears throat> can I get your attention? And began to pray. He wanted to be seen. In fact Jesus said that was the motive of the Pharisees. They stood on the street corner. And for pretense they made long prayers. Why? That they could be seen of men. But their religion wasn't real was it? It was merely seen. But the Bible does teach that if my religion is real. It can't help but to be seen. In Matthew chapter 5 beginning in verse 14. Matthew 5 and verse 14. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden because real religion is seen. It cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I don't know if I've... Have I sung with the kids yet this little light of mine? I, I don't know if I have, but if I haven't, we will. But I love that song because that's what Jesus says. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I won't, won't put a bushel over it. I won't let Satan puff it out. I'm going to let it shine all around the neighborhood. I'm going to hold it up till Jesus comes. 
Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. We need to learn that from the time we're little kids and just keep it in our minds that real religion is seen. I don't do things to be seen, but if I'm totally devoted to Jesus, I can't help but be seen in the way that I live my life. John chapter 19 and verse 38. John 19, 38. After Jesus died, it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. It says he was a disciple of Jesus secretly before his death. Is he a secret disciple now? Nope. He went to Pilate. He didn't secretly say to one of the guards, hey, here's 20 bucks. When you're taking the body down, could you just bring it over to us? No. He went to Pilate. His days of being a secret disciple are over now. But look at verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus. Their secret disciple days are over. Their real religion is now seen, and it cannot help but be seen. The confession is good for others. Why confess and be baptized for the good of Christ? <clears throat> when we confess our faith in Jesus, we prove to be his true friend. We say to all who are present and to all the world, I believe in Jesus. I believe he is who he said he was. And I devote my life to him. And I'm his true friend. And Christ says, you are my disciple, based on our confession and our faith and our actions. And I need to realize that not making a confession is not neutral ground. Neutral ground's bad enough. But no confession is not just neutral ground. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 30, Jesus made this statement. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So Jesus says, you either take one step forward and say you're with me. Because if you just stand there, you have already made the statement, you are against me. You can't just say, eh, I'll just stay in the middle. There is no such thing. There's no neutrality. And to not confess Christ doesn't put you on neutral ground. Jesus says, if you're not with me, you are against me. And the confession plainly, boldly, and courageously lines me up with the Lord. I'm in the Lord's army. The water of life is there. The question is, how do we take it? And God has plainly spoken and said, come to me and give it. Confess your faith in Jesus. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins in his name. And he will give you of the water of life that springs up unto eternal life. If you've not done that, let us assist you in doing that right now while we stand and sing. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam? 